Okay, uh, hello, my name is John Hazelhurst. I'm a clinical lecturer at the University of Birmingham, and I also work at Birmingham Heartland Hospital, which is an IASO Centre of Obesity Medicine. Uh, thank you very much indeed for the invitation to talk today. It's a great pleasure. Um, I've got a fairly broad brief and lots of things to cover, but it will all be framed around the fact that obesity is a disease and not a lifestyle choice. I clearly can't cover everything in 20 minutes, but I hope what I do cover will be fairly clear. I'm conscious I'm speaking to a fairly diverse uh, audience. Um, so let's see how we get on. Here we go. So I don't really have any significant disclosures. Some of my professional training is supported by Nova Nordisk but I certainly haven't had any funds from them directly. Now, um, the starting point of this talk is that obesity is a complex and multifactorial disease, and it's influenced by physiological, psychological, environmental, and socioeconomic and genetic factors. And it's chronic and it's relapsing. So we know that the prevalence of obesity is rising markedly, and the current status quo isn't effective. So something fundamentally needs to change. Uh, and I would suggest that part of what needs to change is recognising obesity as a disease as part of ensuring equitable access to effective treatments. So what is obesity? Well, uh, rightly or wrongly, WHO would describe obesity as overweight and obesity being defined as abnormal or excessive fat accumulation presenting a risk to health. Their definition and not mine. And they add that uh, BMI is a crude uh, population measure. And of course, many of you will be familiar with that. It's the relationship between uh, weight and uh, a person's height. Of course, uh, BMI does not tell the whole story. If you just focus in on the uh, panel in the top left that I've put some superimposed lines on, you'll see that when we look at the relationship between percentage body fat and body mass index, there'll be a significant degree of misclassification. But nevertheless, at a population level, a BMI is useful. Now, when we think about obesity, we have to answer a number of questions that people will ask us when we start to frame obesity as a disease. Now, and one of them relates to metabolically healthy obesity. Some people with obesity are clearly extremely fit. And people will say to you, this is the case, so how can it be a disease? Well, in this study of around three and a half million uh, people, people with medically healthy obesity, so no diabetes, no cholesterol problems, no blood pressure, were compared uh, with similarly healthy people um, of a lower body mass index. And it was shown that metabolically healthy obesity was a risk factor here in this study for all cause mortality, as well as cardiovascular disease. And there is potential that metabolically healthy obesity may only be a temporary, health, uh, temporary state of health for many. Clearly, this doesn't apply to certain individuals who are and remain extremely fit and healthy. But certainly at a population level, this looks to be the case. Now, how common is obesity? Now, some people will say, look, 650 million people in the world or so surely can't have a disease. But in actual fact, they, those people wouldn't question cardiovascular disease. And we know that around 422 million people in the world have cardiovascular disease. And we know obesity is common. So here, uh, the, the darker the shading, the, the more common the uh, prevalence of obesity in individual nations. But when we look at access to treatment, you can see uh, that the situation isn't isn't the same. If you just focus in on the round circles, the black uh, dots rather than the bars. Now, the black dots represent the number of surgeries per one million of the population. Uh, and that's the axis on the far right hand graph. You can see there Sweden doing about 750 surgeries um, per million of the population. If we compare that to this Irish data that I found from the Irish Heart Foundation, in 2018, 12 adult bariatric surgeries per million in the population. Clearly, this is very different from some of that data uh, that you've just seen. So we need to think a little bit now about the causes of obesity. And this is answering, though, that really unhelpful uh, and harmful rhetoric, this eat less, move more, um, that you know many of you will be very familiar with. Um, and let's look a little bit briefly about genetics and biology in particular. Now, this is from the Foresight Report, which is a fairly complicated diagram put together by 300 experts or so. And I'm just going to initially look at the, the bottom blue bit, which is biology. And let's focus in on, on genes. Now, when we look at genes that are associated with obesity, you can see here that many of them are associated within the central nervous system, which is the brain. And clearly, the brain is a major determinant of appetite and energy regulation. 
lots of these talks will talk will focus on twin studies and things like that and i just flag up one here just so you're aware of some of that literature now this is a swedish twin uh, registry uh, but the twins were studied as adults and these were identical or monozygotic twins as well as non-identical or dizygotic twins and they were either grow up, to, up separately and they were separated at age less than three or they grew up together and then the body mass index as adults were compared and what these this study found was that the similarity was far greater in the identical twins irrespective of whether they grew up together or apart showing that there was a clear uh, genetic determinant of body mass index now people say look why do you talk about these uh, twin studies from 20 years ago how are how relevant are they to the twin population people also say look isn't the genetic influence only quite small in terms of absolute terms uh, and that's related to some some studies i'm not going to show today actually if we look at this recent study from just last year looking at 3.1 million common genetic variants in 300,000 people what you can see is that the more genes uh risk genes if you like that, that an individual has the greater the difference in weight and in middle-aged adults there was a 13 kilogram difference between those in the high and lowest risk scores so clearly that's very significant now a monogenic obesity also called single gene obesity is quite rare uh, and most of these genes are implicated in the regulation of, uh, of appetite and energy balance uh, and that's something I, i'm not going to talk about today um, people will say, well, look, genes are so important, but our genes haven't changed, and yet the obesity prevalence uh, is increasing. And I'd say, yes, our genes haven't changed, and yes, prevalence is increasing, but certainly the world we live in and the environment that we're surrounded by has changed markedly uh, in quite a short time frame. So let's look at a few other biological determinants, and I find the next two figures quite helpful in my own clinical practice, and they may be helpful for some of the clinicians uh, in the audience. Um, so, yes, there's lots of comparatively rare uh, genetic forms of obesity. There's various uh, brain conditions, uh, patients who've had brain operations, radiotherapy. There's lots of endocrine conditions associated with, with weight gain. Um, there's lots of medications associated with weight gain, some of which could potentially uh, at times be amended or changed, some of which are, are necessary to continue. Uh, mental health might be relevant to weight gain. Other uh, factors as well might include fragmented sleep, um, uh, short sleep duration, uh, alcohol, shift work, uh, stress is very relevant to some people. Uh, and of course, when people stop smoking, there's typically a weight gain, but clearly the health benefit of smoking far, far outweighs that. So lots of things that we kind of consider when thinking about the biological causes of an individual's uh, obesity. So. I'm not going to talk about genetic environmental interactions here, uh, but I just wanted to flag up that that is indeed uh, very relevant. Now, where we get our food from and the format uh, we get our food is also relevant. Now, this is quite a small study, but it's very interesting. In these 20 uh, weight stable adults, they were given um, either ultra processed food or unprocessed food uh, that was matched for calories and content, essentially. And when people ate the very processed food, they tended to consume more. And despite the fact it was, you know, of same calorie content and same composition. And that was associated with greater weight gain. And it was also associated with changes in hormones. So it looks like it matters kind of how we consume our food as well as what's inside it. There's also a role for a neutral environment. You know, some people will say, look, if genes are so important, well, people just need to make better choices of adults. Well, and that can't possibly be true, can it, when the environment we're exposed to in the uterus can also be relevant to our lifetime risk of, of developing uh, obesity. I'd just like you to focus here on the top left panel uh, and the black bars in particular. Uh, and these are women in their first pregnancy. And then their children were studied at, at age 30. So when they were, you know, kind of young, young adults and looking at their percentage body fat. And you can see there that the BMI of the mothers uh, was very relevant to the percentage body fat of the offspring, even when studied uh, as an adult. So if we just think about linking a few of these causes in a, it's a not very systematic way, but I've hopefully shown to you that there are predisposed individuals, whether that be genetic, perhaps a maternal pre-programming. We're living in a very obesogenic environment, whether that be a westernized lifestyle, potential reduction in home cooking, increased out of home eating, we're constantly surrounded by takeaway food, processed food, etc. Uh, 
food is marketed you know very heavily there are significant socioeconomic factors uh, you know low physical activity potentially as a product of the built environment itb based leisure time um, you know transportation etc so that's the kind of environment uh, that really contributes to the fact that this is a very very difficult treat to treat disease as the body defends its kind of set point and we'll come back to that in a moment so in terms of some of the consequences of obesity, whilst I want you to think of obesity as a disease in and its own right, it is associated with a number of other diseases as well. For example, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, etc. Fortunately, there is an association between body mass index and mortality uh, across a number of causes, as demonstrated by this quite large study here. Now, there's far better ways to think about obesity than body mass index. So here is uh, just a, a crib sheet from the Edmonton Obesity Staging System. And you'll see that there's lots of functional information here, as well as psychological information, as well as information around comorbidities. And if you look at this very large, uh, large study uh, using the N. Haynes cohort, this, this very large American uh, cohort, you'll see here that when we look at BMI, um, it doesn't separate out at all different levels of body mass index in terms of mortality. But when you look at the different levels of the Edmonton obesity uh, staging system, you'll see that that really does separate. So it's actually provided you quite a lot more information about an individual's uh, risk in terms of mortality in particular. Now, fortunately, obesity is associated with a number of different cancers, and I'll demonstrate some of the evidence for that in just a second. Biologically, there are a number of plausible mechanisms, for example, estrogen production from fat cells themselves, different levels of insulin growth factors, low level of inflammation, etc. But actually, what about that patient clinician interaction? And you're going to hear more of that uh, across the day. How many people have been told it's all related to your weight and then not subsequently investigated? Clearly, that can be extremely harmful indeed. As I said, you know, there are a number of cancers that are associated with body mass index. Uh, here, uh, this large study of over 5 million people looking at 22 different cancers and uh, body mass index associated with 17 of those of those malignancies. Is obesity a disease? Absolutely. It's not just a risk factor for metabolic disorders or a condition. It must be considered as a disease. And I want us to be quite consistent as a community uh, that it is a disease rather than a condition disorder or, or risk factor. Um, I'm sorry, I can't be there to kind of debate that with anyone that, you know, potentially disagrees. Um, now, obesity certainly meets the American Medical Association criteria for disease. It's associated with impairment of function. There are characteristic signs or symptoms, and it can unfortunately be associated with significant harm or, or morbidity. And there's a number of organizations and countries that have already recognized obesity as a disease. So this is a very important thing to do. Now, of course, it is possible uh, to change our, our body weight whilst being extremely difficult. Uh, in this study, the chance of a person with obesity and a BMI of 30, 35, reaching a BMI of less than 25, was one in 210 for men and one in 124 for women. This isn't people who've had bariatric surgery. Important to say that this isn't a dieting study. This is just an observational study of a large cohort of people. But it just highlights, you know, it is extremely difficult to change uh, BMI that, that markedly. Nevertheless, you know, lots of people are able to achieve a very clinically significant amount of, of weight loss. Um, when people lose weight, and this is a study looking at different diet, the dark blue is the weight change at the end of the diet, and the light blue is at the end of the follow-up. And you can see that there's a significant amount of weight regain. Now, when we lose weight, we become more hungry and we have a greater desire to eat. Um, in addition, our energy expenditure falls, our total energy expenditure, and our fullness or satiety hormones fall whilst our hunger hormones increase. So this biology is really a, an adaptation to try and maintain our weight um, at, its, uh, at the point at which we, before we lost, lost that weight. There is a role for pharmacotherapy. Uh, lots of things are in development. Some are available, but there are always cost associations and, uh, and limitations, unfortunately. I'm sure that's the case in Ireland, as it certainly is you know, within the UK. Uh, this is a study using uraglutide and uh, different doses and placebo in people with obesity and type 2 diabetes in an add-on to uh, dietary intervention, showing some of the effects and change in, in weight. 
can also be used in weight maintenance after dietary running. Uh, can also be useful to try and prevent weight regain uh, in those who are gaining again following bariatric surgery. But again, cost is a major limitation. Lots of different medications in development. Um, out of time to discuss any of them in any great detail, sadly. Uh, bariatric surgery has been around for a long time. It's clearly extremely effective in resulting in lasting long term weight loss. Um, it is associated with a reduction in mortality risk, as well as increased remission of type 2 diabetes and a reduction in the incidence of developing type 2 diabetes uh, as well. But just worth saying, you know, bariatric surgery isn't for everybody. Not everybody would want it. Not everybody would be uh, able to have it potentially, um, you know, and there can be potentially although rare and not common serious side effects as well as potential associations with changes to mental health so it's always worth anyone considering bariatric surgery to make sure uh, they've not only carefully considered it but spoken to significant experts and that appropriate long-term follow-up is available to them now in this international uh, study in 2016 it just demonstrates that sleeve gastrectomy is now the commonest bariatric surgery in the world followed by ruin y gastric bypass the band sleeve, of which I'm not involved, but I eagerly await the results, will hopefully uh, help us to think about which operation of the commonly performed operations may be most appropriate for a given in individual. A lot of people always say what type of surgery is best, kind of inverted commas, but I think this is very specific to the individual. I wouldn't want to be drawn into any uh, sweeping statements that potentially can be harmful and unhelpful. But certainly in this uh, small but well-controlled study, Comparing sleeve gastrectomy to ruin Y gastric bypass, both interventions were also associated with significant weight loss as well as improvements in quality of life, mortality and cardiovascular risk. So, you know, nevertheless, these surgeries are, are indeed clearly very effective. Um, I'd like to conclude now by just saying that obesity has got major adverse impact on individuals, healthcare system and potentially the economy, although I haven't shown that data today. Um, preventing and treatment of obesity is a public health priority. Prevention and treatment are different. Um, although there is uh, at times some commonality and both need to be adequately funded. Obesity is multifactorial, it's chronic, relapsing, and it's caused by complex uh, interactions and not a lack of willpower. This is further highlighted by the biology that drives weight regain. Recognising obesity as a disease uh, is likely to lead to policies addressing not only the obesogenic environment, also improving equitable access to, to, to treatment. Okay, so thank you very much indeed. Well, I've obviously tried to cover quite a lot of information. Um, I'm sorry if this hasn't been completely exhaustive, but obviously I've only had a limited window. If you'd like to hear me deliver a, a longer talk on a similar topic with a little bit more data, then by all means you can Google, Google the above uh, and a long talk will come up. Many thanks, and I'm sorry I can't be with you today. I'm hopefully currently fast asleep as I'm on nights as part of my general medical commitments at Harlands. So all the best and thanks very much for your time.